for me, that's the goal to a happy and fulfilled life is to think about what the long term things are that you're trying to accomplish and understand that any sort of interim goal along the way is just supposed to be a stepping stone on the way to the bigger thing. It should never be the end point itself. Hello and welcome everyone. I am Vishal Khandelwal and this is The 1% Show. This show is an open-ended exploration into the minds of the wisest people around to help us learn to think, invest and live each day a little, as little as 1% better. You can learn more at vishalkhandelwal.com. My guest today is Annie Duke, author, corporate speaker and consultant in the decision-making space. She is also a special partner focused on decision science at First Round Capital Partners, a seed stage venture fund. For two decades, Annie was one of the top poker players in the world. In 2004, she bested a field of 234 players to win her first World Series of Poker bracelet. The same year, she triumphed in the $2 million winner-take-all invitation-only World Series of Poker Tournament of Champions. She retired from the game in 2012. She is also author of multiple wonderful books, including Thinking in Bets, How We Decide, and her latest being Quit, The Power of Knowing When to Walk Away. In Quit, Annie draws on stories from wide swath of high achievers, including elite mountain climbers, business leaders, and entertainers to argue that quitting is a good thing when applied at the right time. And much like poker career, life, she says, is one long game and the biggest winners are also the most strategic quitters. With this and no further delay, Annie, welcome to The 1% Show and thank you so much for agreeing to do this. Thank you for having me, Pashal. It's my pleasure, Annie. Thank you so much. I've learned a lot from your books, from your lessons, from your lectures over the past many years. So special thanks to you for all that. Uh, I wish to start this conversation with a book of yours that not many people know about as much as Thinking in Beds, How to Decide and Quit. It's your memoir title, Annie Duke, How I Raised, Folded, Bluffed, Flirted, Cursed and Won Millions at the World Series of Poker, which was published in 2005 and chronicles a journey as a professional poker player which you had never originally set out to become. So tell us a bit about that journey, which got started rather accidentally, but one that has taken you a long way over the years. Yeah, so I I started off my adult life um, as an academic. I was doing PhD work at Penn. I was there for five years um, studying cognitive science, and I had a National Science Foundation fellowship. So, you know, I was on my way to a tenure track position. Um, and actually had uh, job talks lined up at several universities. But I'd been struggling during my last year with um, just like a chronic stomach issue that became quite acute in the middle of my last year. And I actually ended up in the hospital for a couple of weeks. And, you know, with, it was just very clear that I needed to take some time off in order to attend to my health. So I canceled my job talks and um, decided to take a year off. And it was during that year off that, to be quite honest, I just needed money um, because I didn't have my fellowship anymore while I was taking my leave of absence. And I started playing poker as a way to make money. Um, Just to kind of like set the stage, it was, I think that nowadays people sort of think it's it's not as weird a choice as it actually was. because poker has been on television for so long at this point, 20 years. And, you know, there's internet poker and there's all these ways now that people get introduced to poker as a, a completely valid thing to be doing in order to make money. But this was in the 90s before any of that was true. So the only reason why I started playing poker was because my brother was already playing. He was he was quite good. He had already made the final table of the World Series of Poker. And... um he had, so, you know, I'd sort of observed him playing a lot, gotten to watch him a lot. Um, he had flown me out to Las Vegas for a couple of vacations during graduate school and had taught me a little bit about how to play. Um, so I had more knowledge than kind of like the average person um, about poker. And so I started playing it just kind of as something to do in the meantime during my one year leave in order to be able to just support myself. And 
you know, the meantime turned into 18 years and I played until 2012 when I retired. Um, at one point I was the winningest female in the history of the game. I think now I haven't played in 10 years. I'm still number four. I think someone told me that, I guess that might be true. I don't know. I didn't look it up myself. And, uh, you know, and I won the tournament champions. I was the only woman to win the um, national heads up championship. I have a World Series poker bracelet, so it was, it was quite a fruitful career. That's kind of how that happened. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think at several places you mentioned about that you were a lone woman on a poker table, surrounded by a lot of men, right? So how's been that experience over the years? And I, I am sure, as you mentioned, right, a lot of times you were called lucky. Instead of smart, intelligent poker player, you were called lucky. Just, I think, being a woman uh, uh, in the company of men out there playing poker. So how has how's been that experience? What are the lessons that that kind of an experience has left on you? Um, yes, I mean, people ask me this question a lot. And particularly, I think people tend to ask me this question in relationship to do I have any advice for women who are in business settings? which are very male dominant. And my answer is kind of a little bit, a little bit not in the sense that I didn't have a boss. You know, I, nobody, nobody had any uh, control over like whether I was promoted or not, like what kind of salary I got, that kind of thing. So there were certain things about being in that environment that just kind of don't apply to environments where, the discrimination can express itself in ways that can actually like hurt your career. Um, so I just want to like sort of set that out as a caveat to anything that I say. Now on the flip side, um, there's no HR department in poker. So particularly when I was starting out, uh, you know, I don't, I can't speak to the last 10 years, but uh, when I was playing uh, the way that uh, women, were treated in the game was pretty poor. Um, in the ways that you would expect that would be usual, like lots of comments on whether the women were hot in ways that nobody was commenting on whether the men were hot. Uh, and trust me, there were, I mean, I suppose there were some hot men, but a lot of them were not. And, um, and people were like very focused on like what you looked like uh, in a way that was pretty difficult. Um, and, I, I think that when women come into male spaces like that, particularly poker, which is a, a very weird space where if you lose to me, you actually have to hand me money, which is different than even like trading where it's kind of done on a ledger sheet, you know, like there's exchange going on. But when I, if you're on the other side of a trade from me, um, you don't have to walk over to me and put the cash in my hands. So it's this very kind of like personal confrontation that's zero sum. And I think it brings up just like a lot of emotion and kind of stereotypes and, um, you know, in some cases like anger uh, that um, you're losing in particular to a woman. So th this is true. I mean, there's a lot of like emotions at a poker table regardless, like, male to male. But I think for women in particular, it's particularly difficult, um, particularly when you combine it with sort of, first of all, the sexualization and also the, just sort of the the rampant kind of sexism, right, that, that are going on. And, and I want to be clear that there are lots of poker players who are not sexist. There's lots of poker players who don't react this way, but inevitably there's going to be some portion of them and when there aren't a lot of other women at the table, that becomes hard to sort of combat. So I think that, that that's what I would say was like the main downside. Um, the upside to it was that you could use all of that to your advantage. So essentially, if you think like, look, somebody's stereotyping you um, in a situation where it's like you're strategically thinking about how to... Um, how what what the best strategy is to play against them you can use the stereotype that you believe they have of you um against them basically so like a, a simple example of that would be um let's say that you so one one of the ways that people would think about women 
was that women couldn't think more than one level deep. So in other words, it would mean like if I bet big, it would mean I had a good hand. If I didn't bet, it would mean I had a weak hand. So uh, mainly because they wouldn't think like the, that I had the guts or the creativity or something like that to bluff. Um, so if I know that that's the way that you think about me, then uh, then it's going to be easier for me to bluff you, obviously, because you're going to give me more, in, in a weird way, more credit for a hand than I actually deserve. So now what has to go along with that, of course, is that when you now see me play and I'm beating you, you have to be willing to adjust your prior. And this is where we get a difference between like a prior and a stereotype. So priors are loosely held assumptions about the world that you change as new information comes in, hopefully in some way that's neither overreacting nor underreacting to the new information. A stereotype is durable. So the question then becomes, well, if I was beating people, like if we take Montana, so in Montana, this, this kind of environment was particularly true. I was playing against a lot of older men who were, you know, in their 60s. And this is kind of like how they were spending their retirement. And I was in my 20s. So you can imagine that these stereotypes now were pretty strong, right? So the question then becomes, if I was winning against them, why weren't they adjusting their stereotypes? And this is where your luck comes into play, is that it's not chess. So if I'm beating you at chess, whatever your stereotypes of me are, if I beat you five games in a row, you've just got to admit I'm better than you. Because what, what else are you going to blame it on? right? Like that you had a bad breakfast or something. Like, I don't, what are, you, what are you supposed to say there, right? But in poker, the person who is trying to confirm their beliefs, right? Like the stereotype that they have of you has this out when new information comes in and that out is luck. So it allows them to sort of use the term, right? Not quit the stereotype, not quit their views, of the person that they're playing against because they can just say, oh, they're getting lucky. And th for them, that also serves a dual purpose, which is not only do, do you get to say that I'm getting lucky, but also you get to say that you're playing well. Because by definition, if the reason I'm winning is because I'm lucky, then it's not because you're playing poorly or at least playing poorly in comparison to the way that I'm playing. So uh, so it allows you to sort of preserve that positive self-image that you're trying to preserve um, while still maintaining the negative image or the sort of chauvinistic image of me at the table. So, you know, so so it's kind of like it's it's the good and the bad with it, right? Like there were a whole bunch of things that I didn't enjoy about being a woman. And then there were things that were to my advantage about being a woman in the game. That's a great point. Uh, you mentioned about chess, and I quote uh, author Alan Rufus, uh, who said, uh, "Life is like a game of chess. To win, you have to make a move. Knowing which move to make comes with insight and knowledge. And by <clears throat> learning the lessons that are accumulated along the way, we become each and every piece within the game called life." Now, you have argued that life and business are like poker and not chess. Please explain. Yeah. So, um. When we think about decision making, right, in a business setting um, or in life, um, generally when we're making decisions, we're under a, a very strong influence of uncertainty in two forms. And the two forms of uncertainty are just plain old luck. So uh, I can make a decision that's going to work out 80% of the time. And that means by definition, I'm going to get a bad outcome 20% of the time. I don't know when I'm going to observe it. Um, a, you know, a simple example of that would be, you know, I can go through a green light at an intersection and uh, just have something very unlucky happen to me, like my tire could blow. And so now all of a sudden, even though like I followed all the rules and like I can see that the light is green and I'm, I'm making a good decision about whether to proceed through that intersection, um, just bad luck gets in the way. And, and, you know, and I can lose. The pandemic is a good example of luck. Uh, the best laid plans, you know, many people's best laid plans were really frustrated by the pandemic. Um, and it doesn't mean that the decisions that they made prior to the pandemic were poor, 
right? It means that there was some influence of luck that then caused the outcome. In the simplest sense, um, I can, you know, if you offer me two to one on a bet on a, a coin flip, which is 50 50, I can call heads. And once that coin leaves my hand, right, I don't have any control over what the coin is going to land. And I'm, it may come tails. It doesn't mean it was a bad decision by me because I'm winning to that bet. It just means that I can't control the flip of the coin, right? Okay, so that's just the influence of luck. But then um, there's also hidden information. So I uh, rarely would decision-making be coin flip-like in the sense that you know for sure that the coin is going to flip 50-50, right? It's usually that we're making some sort of forecast, like, Given what we know, which is usually very little, we're making our best guess that the coin is going to flip 50-50. And I think that we've all had that feeling after we make a decision of, you know, I wish I knew then what I know now. And that's kind of that feeling of, ooh, I learned a whole bunch of new stuff, right? So um, we just know very little in comparison to all there is to be known. Like if you're hiring a candidate, what do you really know about the person? Right? You know, not much. So that's really kind of like business decisions, life decisions are made under those conditions. A paucity of information, a big influence of luck on the outcome. Now let's take poker versus chess and look at those two sources of uncertainty. In chess, there's not really a strong influence of luck. There's a little bit of an influence of luck in, in terms of like your opponent could be sick that day. So you don't have control over that, right? So that would be lucky for you. Um, you could get sick the day that you're playing the match. That would be unlucky for you. Uh, you know, that kind of thing, right? So, so there's a little bit of an influence of luck, but not a strong one. Not in the sense of like somebody rolls dice and if it's a seven, you get an extra bishop. If it's snake eyes, you lose your queen, right? So none, none of that is happening, right? So there isn't that random element in that sense to how the pieces are moving, along the board, that's only done by an active skill. And then obviously the hidden information, well, I can see all of your pieces. So theoretically, I should be able to know what all of your possible moves are. And then uh, I can figure out what all of my possible responses are and so on and so forth. And the deeper I can get into that game, the better I'm going to be at chess. Now, again, is there some hidden information? Sure. Like, I don't know. I may not know what your favorite openings are. Uh, I, I, I won't know that you maybe have just read a book that, um, you know, where you were studying a particular type of end game or something like that. Those things would be helpful, right? Um, the more that I know about my opponent, the, the better my information is going to be about them. But, but in terms of the pieces themselves, I know where they sit. Um, so that doesn't sound very lifelike. It doesn't sound very businesslike. I know, I know all the pieces. I know what my moves are that are available. I know what their moves are that are available back. And uh, nobody's going to, you know, run across the, the table and take a piece off the board randomly when I don't know what's going to happen. But poker is obviously very unlike that because I can't see my opponent's cards. So you have all the same things in chess about like, I don't necessarily know like whether you favor raising or folding in certain situations or how you value your hands, right? I'm going to learn that as I go along and I can build a model of you. But I certainly don't know what your cards are. Th those are face down. And there's a huge random element, which is the deal of the cards themselves, right? Like I have no control over the deal of the cards. So uh, I could have a really good hand and you know, a card comes that I don't have any control over and it can completely change the situation. Like I got in an accident in the middle of the, in the middle of the intersection. So that just like maps on to poker much better. I mean, I'm sorry, poker just maps on to business or life decision much better. And it's not just me who thinks that because game theory, which is really the study of decision-making under uncertainty, which is how we think about, you know, these kind of like decision making between more than one person, not just for yourself, but for every, you know, where you're deciding against other people. Um, that was developed by John von Neumann and Oscar Morgenstern based on the game of poker, not based on the game of chess. And von Neumann was asked about this. Um, and basically what he said was, well, the reason why I didn't base it on chess is because chess isn't really a game. 
not in the sort of game theory academic sense of it. And the reason is he said is that chess is just a calculation. The point being, because you can see all the pieces. So one could boot, brute force that game until the end because all the information is available to you. Um, and that is not very lifelike. I completely relate to your idea about missing information and uh, uncertainty, right? And decision making under uncertainty, being an investor, right? Even when we are looking at businesses uh, for long term investing, when we're analyzing businesses, uh, most of the information is available, but there's a lot of important information which is missing. You, you need to find out those missing pieces of information or you need to probably assess them much in advance while making a decision because it's all uncertain. You have no control over, uh, you have no control over the outcome. And you have no idea how that information or that uncertainty is going to pan out over a period of time while making a decision. And that's the reason as as the uncertainty rolls over, as you get more information over a period of time, you may have to change your decision as well as an investor. Uh, in your book, Thinking in Bets, uh, which is one of my personal favorites here, uh, you write the quality of our lives is the sum of decision quality plus luck. Uh, now, how does one tackle the decision quality aspect and learn to make better decisions, especially under uncertainty? So we are, we, we understood that uh, poker is a game of uncertainty and we have to make decisions and we have to base our decisions based on how things evolve and how hands change. Uh, but how does one learn to do that? In fact, with a view of explaining this idea of quality decision making to say a 20 year old, can you please break down decisions into the most basic component parts and explain the anatomy of sound decision making? There's there's two pieces of creating a good decision. Well, first of all, let me just say that sort of as an umbrella, you have to accept uncertainty. So in order to be a good decision maker, you have to accept that you're not going to know for sure, right? Because we're not omniscient. We don't have a time machine. Now, on the flip side, you also have to accept that you don't, that there's almost nothing that you know nothing about. So what you'll see is is kind of like, two reactions to uncertainty. Very often one would be analysis by paralysis, which is someone who's continuing to sort of rev the decision, trying to get to 100% sure that it's the best decision that you could make or trying as hard as they can to get enough information that somehow they could guarantee the outcome that they're going to observe. All right. So that's a bad thing to do because it's unrealistic, right? You're, you're reaching for something that just doesn't exist. But then the other thing sometimes we'll do, people will do is just like, ah, screw it, <laughs> right? Like, you know, and that's where you get like, oh, I just go with my gut, you know, ah, you know, it's too, you know, whatever, like things are uncertain. So they just, you know, they just go. And neither of those two things is a particularly good reaction to uncertainty. Instead, what you want to say is, look, I have to embrace that there's uncertainty and there's no way that I'm ever going to get to 100% sure. Like I'd be lucky to get to 60% on anything. Um, but also, it's my responsibility to start figuring out how I can improve the information that I'm inputting into the decision. So we can think about sort of two pieces of the decision. If we think about luck, um, the way that luck influences the decision is that you choose some sort of option, and then that option is associated with a set of possible outcomes. And each of those possible outcomes has some probability associated with it. So in the omniscience case, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm sort of, I can get to omniscient about a coin flip because I know everything there is to know about the coin. Um, and in that case, what I know is that there's two outcomes associated with it, heads and tails, and each of those has a 50% chance of occurring. Now, I could obviously have a weighted coin where heads could be 80% or tails could be 20%, or I could have a four-sided coin, or like I could have a six-sided dice Right. And so then there would be like six, five, four, three, two, one for the answers. Right. And each of those would occur one sixth of the time, so on and so forth. So that would be so. So now basically where we can think about luck having its influence is between the decision that you make. I'm going to roll the dice. Right. I'm going to roll. Right. And the outcome that you actually observe. OK, so the first piece of making a great decision is trying to make that forecast. So you have to view part of a really good decision process is to make make that forecast. And the forecast is just for any option that I'm considering, uh, what do I think the outcomes are? 
And what's the probability of those outcomes occurring? That's just the definition of a forecast. And obviously, as you're considering different options, you're essentially changing different conditions. And so you're trying to think about if I change X, how do I think that would affect this forecast? If I change Y, how do I think that would affect that forecast? So you have to be explicit that that's what every decision is. In the simplest sense, if I have two routes that I could choose to take to work, and I choose route A over route B, whatever my values are, let's say in this case it's time, I want to get there quickly, I'm making a forecast that route A is going to get me there faster than route B. Right, So that's the first thing that you have to start thinking about is what do those forecasts look like. Now, of course, the thing, and, and we can, let's call that seeing the luck clearly. Right, I don't have any control over luck. But I want to see its influence clearly. So I have to start thinking probabilistically, stop thinking about guarantees, and start thinking, you know, getting as clear a view as possible as I can on what those possibilities are and what the probabilities are. All right, so that's where luck is intervening. Good so far? Okay. Um, so now let's think about the hidden information piece. Well, that's intervening at the belief part. So we can think about our beliefs are the foundation of every decision that we make. We could say every forecast that we make, right? Um, so if those are the foundation of that, we can think about where we have cracks in that foundation. And those cracks are occurring either because there's stuff we don't know or because the things that we think we know are inaccurate in some way. Right, so people hold inaccurate beliefs all the time. Um, and we can think about like this is a place where, as an example, like bias is going to have its effect. Right. So our beliefs are biased in many different ways. They're also noisy. Right. We can believe different depending on the day. We'll believe different things about information that we're looking at. And so the way that we can think about improving decision process there is how do we put in processes that are going to help to improve the quality of the information that we're inputting into the decision? Right? And obviously, I write a lot about that. We can talk about that. And so now when we put these two things together, basically we can say, hopefully the quality of the information that I have is as good as is available to me in this moment, that I've done the work to make that good. Then I've considered the alternatives, right? So I've thought about the different alternatives that are available to me. For each of those alternatives, I've thought about the outcomes that could occur and the probability of those things occurring. And then I've matched those up to my values. What do I mean by that? And this is a piece that we really miss. And when I'm matching those up to my values, I'm saying, what are the things that I'm trying to gain? And what are the things that I'm willing to cost myself in order to gain it? So that's like, values like maybe you value making the most money and time with your family doesn't matter very much to you or maybe time with your family matters a lot to you and money matters less so how you're you know because those two things it's hard to have those two things occur together usually making a lot of money sacrifices time with your family right so we're having to balance out those values that we have um so in investing we would think about that as risk right like how much risk are we willing to take on for what we can gain okay so um um, so, so that is that, that structure. Now, the best way to improve this whole process, if we think about those two things that we're really trying to accomplish, right? How do we see the luck clearly? How do we have, how do we improve the information that we have that's being inputted into that decision? And then obviously we're laying our values on top of that. What is it we're trying to gain? What, what will we be willing to cost ourselves? Is in, in there, and this is the most important thing, is that you have to get to what's called the outside view. So the inside view is like our own beliefs and our perspectives and the way that we kind of think about the world. The outside view, view let's call it what's true of the world independent of our own belief. Um, and we can kind of get there two ways. Technically, that would be just kind of a statistical model, what's true of the world in general, uh, which we would talk about base rates for that. Um, and then the other thing is getting other people's perspective on the same information that we're looking at. So base rates help us with that forecasting. Because you can look up for anything like, for example, if I asked you, should you go to Florida on a vacation to Miami in September of next year, you might want to consider the probability of a hurricane. 
Okay, because that's one of the possible outcomes. I'm thinking about where should I go on vacation? If I go in September or October to Florida, maybe there's going to be a hurricane. So maybe that wouldn't be the best place to go. But I want to try to figure out like what are the chances that a hurricane hits during my vacation? And you've seen a lot of hurricanes on the news recently. So you're like, no way, I'm not going because I think it's like 90% chance that a hurricane is going to hit. Well, what you can do is you can actually just go look up like the last five years, like how many category three hurricanes or above have hit Florida. Um, and this is going to help you to make that decision. So there's all sorts of stuff that you can look up that will tell you what's true of the world in general. And that's a base rate is just like, how often does something happen in the situation that I'm considering? Right. So you can do that, for example, for like within a business, um, you can say, you know, how often are we falling short of sales targets or, in, you know, improving on sales targets? Broadly, if you're starting a company, you can think about how long does it take a company of my type to get to break even? Um, and that's going to help you to understand how much runway you should create and so on and so forth. So base rates are a very important step in helping us to make those forecasts and make those forecasts more accurate. Because they're getting away from our own bias into sort of what's true of the world in general. And then you're just tweaking around that base rate. Like, do I think I'm better than average, a little bit worse than average? But um, but you shouldn't go too far from that. Um, so that's that piece. And then the other piece that really helps you is I, I should get your opinion on things. Because you you may be biased, but you're biased in a different way than I am. So uh, if I'm trying to figure out what career I want to have, where do I think, um, you know, where do I think my best opportunity is in terms of what my values are? I can go to somebody who uh, has, a, who I think is an expert, like a mentor. And I can say, here's what my values are. Here's what I'm trying to get out of my career. Here's the path that I want to get on. What do you think is reasonable in terms of tracking from entry level on what would be the signpost that would tell me that I would be getting to where I want to go? Uh, given what my interests are, what do you think a good fit for me is? So on and so forth, right? So, so that would be an example for like a personal decision. Um, if you're making a hiring decision, you want a bunch of people to interview the candidate independently and offer their views independently to balance each other out so you can see where there's disagreement. And where there's disagreement, you would have a discussion about it, which would then... Um, help to improve the quality of the information that you're thinking about in terms of who you're going to hire. I hope all that, that was clear. I mean, I know that was a lot, but it's not a small question. So no, that's right. I would like you to continue on that. But just before that, uh, just a small interruption. Uh, you mentioned about the idea of inputting right information, which also helps you make better decisions, right? Uh, we're living in a world of too much noise and too much information. So how do you actually separate that signal from noise and find out that right information that you need to use to to base your decision on because that is where it starts, right? Yeah. So, I mean, I think that this is one of the biggest problems and it's uh, something that I think is quite hard to address without helping people to understand what the right questions are to ask of information that you see. So first of all, number one, you should just say on its face, does it seem reasonable? Right. Um, and it, you know, lots of information that you see on its face just doesn't seem reasonable. Okay. So like, as an example, if someone tells you that there's some sort of supplement, right, that will help you to lose 10 pounds a week on its face, that's unreasonable. Right. So, so you always want to ask that question, like, does this seem unbelievable? Right. Like it's, does it do, is my reaction? It's too good to be true. Um, and you have to, and the problem for us is because of the way that we reason toward the desires that we want to be true. Look, nobody wants to just eat healthy and exercise, right? So when someone tells you something like this, you kind of really badly want to believe that it's true. So, um, so I think that that's something important is just on its face, does this seem reasonable given what I know about the world? You can go find experts that would be able to tell you whether it's reasonable and you find should find lots and lots of experts because if there's disagreement among the experts 
then you need to know that too, so that you understand that something isn't so settled. So, so those are just like some clues. But one thing I want people to watch out for is that there's a weird thing, a, a thing about our cognition, which is the more we hear something, the more true it sounds. And the less nuanced a message is, the more true it sounds to us. So you also have to remember that like very simple repeat, repeated messages, you need to start to question because the nuanced messages are probably more likely to be true. In other words, like, eh, you know, some people lose weight, some people don't. It depends on the person. You have to do diet and exercise along with it. You know, it's like the fine print, right? Um, which we don't like to hear. So, so that's kind of like piece number one is, does it seem true on its face, right? Does it seem kind of unbelievable? Um, have I actually gone to multiple sources to try to understand whether this thing is true? This is bad news for Twitter, right? So if someone says something on Twitter, I'll be like, oh, that's interesting. And then I go to the web and I start to try to find who said that, is there information, is there disagreement about it, so that I can kind of understand if this thing, you know, that maybe I want to be true, um, whether that's actually true or not. Right? So that's kind of the first piece is you have to have more than one source. And it has to seem within the realm of reasonable things that could be true of the world. The other thing, though, and I think that this is really important in this day and age, is that you have to be able to understand the questions that you're supposed to ask about information or data that's being presented to you. Because I think that we really forget sort of this. What I would say is this the in in the simplest way I would put it is that you should always say, what's the denominator? So let me explain. So you have the numerator, which is like whatever, the cases that they're telling you about. But then you have like the whole population, the whole set of instances of cases that you're telling you, you about. So, so the cases they're telling you about are the numerator. And then there's the whole set that that's been pulled from, which would be the denominator. So let me give you an example of some bad uh, use of not asking what's the denominator. I'll give you a few examples. So we see lots of instances of like uh, AI drawing incredible pictures or um, creating amazing stories, like answering questions in this very coherent way that make us feel very scared, right? But the question is, what's the denominator here? So you're showing me the successful instances of a picture being drawn or a, some, you know, an AI answering a question that sounds like very human-like. But what I need to know is how many queries were there total, right, that you were pulling that query from? Because... Uh, you know, and this is sort of the data mining question, right? Like if you asked it a question a thousand times and 999 of them were complete nonsense and you show me the one that was amazing, that tells me something about like, you know, what's going on with this artificial intelligence, right? But we don't ask what's the denominator. Someone just shows us this amazing answer from an AI and we're like, ooh, they're amazing, so that, that's like an example of like, we really want to know what's the denominator. Another example of what's the denominator would come from some information about vaccines. So um, I, as an example, when vaccines first came out, you, you saw a lot of information coming out about, oh, look at this number of people died who were vaccinated. So I'll give you an example of how you would want to sort of take that further. So let's say they tell you that there were um, five, you know, 5,000 people who died within six months of getting vaccinated. The first question I would ask is, how old were they? So I want to know that, right? So let's say it turned out that they were all like over 60 or 70. Let's say they were over 70. Like, let's say it was right at the beginning of the vaccination. So I actually saw this happening. So there, it's right at the beginning, they're vaccinating people in America, the people who were vaccinated first were old. And they go, look, 5,000 people died within six months of getting the vaccine. And my question is, what's the denominator? Like they're over 80. How many people who did not get the vaccine or what's the base rate, right, for people who did not get the vaccine who, who also died? That's the thing that I want to understand, right? So that's one way that I could ask about the denominator is, is that unusual for people of that age to die within six months of anything? Because other, otherwise, I could say, look, someone went out and had a chili for dinner, and within six months, they died. It's about as sensical as saying that. 
because it's like, okay, but that doesn't mean that that's causal. It depends on what the denominator is, right? So that's one way I could think about the denominator. The other thing I could ask is out of how many, right? So that's another way that I could ask for a denominator. I could say, well, out of how many? So if it's, you know, a hundred million people got vaccinated and 5,000 people died within within the, the uh, six month period. All right, well, that doesn't seem so bad. I could also say compared to how many people who were unvaccinated died, right? So that's another way that I could do it. And in specific, I could even drill down more and say of the vaccinated people, how many died of COVID versus the unvaccinated people, what percentage of them died of COVID? So notice these are all like denominator questions. I'm asking for reference classes so I understand what I'm supposed to compare this to. And I think that this is something that we just don't see a lot, right? So, so I mean, here's here actually here's an example that's happening in real time where you're not creating the denominator. I've been seeing a lot of stuff about people saying, "Oh, look, whenever there's a lot of a, a lot of counting, right? When counting goes on for a long time in a state, Democrats win." Okay, so this is obviously a way to say that there's cheating going on, right? Well, there's two things that you can look at in terms of denominators for this, which is how many states count for a long time? Because maybe you're just telling us about the swing states, which are counting for a long time, but maybe there's other states that are counting for a long time that we just don't hear about because the races were more obvious. And that turns out to be, yes, that's true. Every single no state is done counting on election day, it turns out. Um, because they have mail-in ball balloting and military ballots and so on and so forth. So just as like uh, Arizona is counting, so it's like Texas and Florida. We just really don't hear about it because those states are already sort of set. The, they're, they're settled because there's wider margins. So you can statistically say it's settled. So that's one denominator that I can look at is, is it something particularly unusual to these states that they're counting long? Or is every state counting a long time? I just don't hear about it, right? So that's one way we can get to a denominator. The other thing you can say is, well, is it only Democrats that win in those situations, right? Or are there Republicans also winning when there's long counting going on? And of course, the answer to that is yes. Um, in, in the places where there was a lot of counting, it was actually a majority of, I believe, a majority of Republican representatives for the House of Representatives has actually won those long counts. We can see that because they're winning the, the House, right? Um, and then you have a state like Nevada, for example, where the governor, Lombardo, who is a Republican, he won in that state. Um, uh, so we do see these states. And then Ron Johnson, of course, in Wisconsin, which was a long count also, he was a Republican in that state as well. So now I can see when I look at it, it's actually a mix. When I start to ask, what, what am I comparing that to? Um, we start to get a very different view of it. So if, if I were to at, tell people, like, how do you deal with this information? That would probably be the most important thing that I would say is you have to always say, like, in comparison to what? What's the reference class? Tell me what the denominator is, because this information on its own is probably not valuable to me. And in fact, it it's often being used either consciously or, or subconsciously to be spinning you. Sure. So you, you, you may now continue on your point about the anatomy of decisions. So I interrupted you about the information thing. You talked about beliefs, you talked about values, you talked about the rule of luck. What else is there a part of making a sound decision? So uh, the other part of making a sound decision is that you have to have, you have, to have a, a process that disciplines bias and noise. So what that means is that you have to be, um, for example, in a hiring process, you, this is why you would have a hiring rubric. In an investment process, you would have an investment rubric. In other words, there's a checklist of information that you need to gather in order to uh, make the decision. And then there is also a rubric, which is the subjective judgments. How, how am I modeling that information um, that's being elicited? And that should be happening in a regular fashion. You can do that as a one-off. For more one-off decisions, you can create something repeatable. So a repeatable process is incredibly important for repeatable decisions. One of the advantages of that is not only does that improve the way that you're going to think about the decision itself, but it's also going to create some sort of artifact that you can now go back and look at. So that as you start to get the outcome unfolding, you can go back and say, what was I thinking at the time? Was it reasonable for I, for me to be thinking that? How is my forecast? You can loop the forecast back into um, 
uh, the outcome that you actually observe to start to improve the accuracy around that. So you want to have discipline across that decision process in a way that uh, makes it less likely that bias is going to interfere. It's going to make it less noisy. It's going to make sure that when two people are thinking about the decision that um, you're getting similar judgments from both of them. Yeah, you're going to create it, make it so there's less confusion so that there's more uh, clear communication between them. Um, you're going to make sure that uh, you're getting this, the same information as being inputted so that people can't highlight or low light information that favors their point of view or doesn't favor their point of view. And you're going to create an artifact that is going to help you then to close feedback loops, which is the last piece of decision making is you have to figure out a way to close the feedback loop. Right. So we have a tendency to, uh, let me think how to say this well. Um, we're really bad at closing feedback loops for a variety of reasons. One is we tend to do it in a biased way. So when we're looking at other people's outcomes, we tend to think that if they get a bad outcome, it's they were bad decision makers. If we, they get a good outcome, they were good decision makers. That's a horrific mistake to make. Um, for ourselves, as I said about poker players, if we if we get a bad outcome, we'll tend to pawn it off on luck. And if we get a good outcome, we'll tend to pawn it off on skill. Um, also a horrific mistake to make um, as we're trying to sort of figure out what are the dual influences of skill and luck on any decision that we make. We also um, don't remember decisions very well. So um, if we try to close a feedback loop without actually having an artifact of the decision and what we're thinking at the time, uh, that's not going to be particularly high quality and we're not going to be able to close that feedback loop. Um, and then the last reason we why we don't cl close feedback loops very well is because we kind of think about, we think about the thing that we're supposed to close the loop on is whatever the ultimate outcome that we were trying to achieve is. So, so I'll, I'll give you an example of this. So let's say that you're, Let's say that you're an investor. Let's say you're a venture investor. So if you're in venture and you invest early in a company, you're not going to get the ultimate outcome. In other words, it doesn't end up exiting at over a billion dollars, right? You're not going to get that outcome for sometimes 10 years. So that's the way that we think about the outcome. Right. It's like the thing, whatever the goal is, whatever the final thing is that we're trying to have happen. So what I would hear from people in venture a lot is, well, it's very long cycle. And so it's not like poker where you find out if you won the hand right away. Um, this is something where we have to wait a really long time. And so we can't we can't get the same feedback. Um, so it's impossible for us. And then what would follow that often is just sort of like, that's why venture is all about pattern matching, right? Like I just see a good founder and I know it. So, I mean, first of all, on that note, if an options trader said to you, I just see a good op, you know, trade and I, and I know it, you'd be like, I'm never investing any money in you. But so on its face, like that, again, if we think about like on its face, does that make sense? Um, the answer should, to that should be no. Um, but it what really doesn't make sense is that, you invest and then it's 10 years until you have the outcome. That's absurd because it's not like you invest and then you're Rip Van Winkle and you go to sleep for 10 years and then someone comes and wakes you up and you go, oh, how'd that company do? We have to remember that whenever we make any decision that there, the world, we're still getting to watch the world unfold in between whatever the decision is and whatever the ultimate goal is that we had for that decision. And um, so if we take venture, for example, like let's say that you invest at Series B. Well, Series C is going to come around at some point and it's going to come around a lot sooner than the ultimate outcome is going to come out. And it's a really big signal for success, right? If a company raises a B and fails to raise a C, it's a bad sign. Like they're not going to be a billion dollar company. It's it's a necessary step in order to get to the, in, in order to get to the exit. So that's going to happen relatively quickly. There's no reason that you shouldn't be able to close that loop really fast, right? You should, there's other loops that you can close. Like what's the quality of their team? What's their ability to retain talent? Uh, you know, what's their churn? 
are, did they, is, is their revenue growing? I mean, there's all sorts of things that are happening to that company in between the day you invest in the exit. And you should be constantly trying to close those feedback loops all the time. And I think that we we sort of forget about that part and we'll just sort of say, ah, oh, you know, there's nothing I can know because I'm not going to know for 10 years. And it's like, that's, I completely reject that. So that that's a really big part of good decision making is figuring out how do I actually get feedback quickly? And then what goes along with that, if we go back to the forecasting problem, is that once we decide that there are milestones that we can start to track, then we should be forecasting those milestones at the point that we make the decision, right? So we should include those milestones in our decision process, because if we know that those milestones are really important to getting good outcomes, then we ought to include that in the decision. So like if we go back to someone who's thinking about an entry level position, you can talk to a mentor and you can find out what the milestones are to tell you that 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 position is working out well for you. Right. So you can ask, like, what's the average time to um, what's the average time to get promoted? That would be something that you could ask. You could say, like, what are my one on ones going to look like? What's the type of feedback that I'm going to be getting? What type of feedback should I be asking for? What, you know, my performance reviews? Uh, am I getting raises? What, you know, am I getting bonuses? I mean, there's a bunch of stuff you can ask. Or what are the early signals or the signals along the way that are going to tell me whether this is working out for me or not? And you could also include for yourself, like, am I finding that I'm happy? Do I feel fulfilled in my work? These kinds of things that are all, you know, sort of intervening between whatever the ultimate outcome is, which maybe you want to be CEO someday. I don't know. But you figure out what those interim milestones are and start including those in the decision process as well. Great point. Uh, I would now like to talk to you about your new book, Quit, uh, which is fascinating. And before that, I would want to take a short detour and talk about one of the best books I read of people who have summited Mount Everest. Uh, it is an autobiography of Ed Vistius, who's written this book called No Shortcuts to the Top. It's a wonderful book. In this book, Vestios documents his 16-year-old journey summiting all 14 of the world world's 8,000 mount, mountain peaks and his strategies to maintain risk in extreme environments. In one of the scenes, which I really love, right, uh, uh, while describing the deaths of a couple of his friends who made the grave mistake of reaching the summit of Everest in the evening, Ed warned, getting to the top is optional, getting down is mandatory. Now, this lesson comes through most forcefully when Ed recounts how he once attempted to reached the summit at Everest, but backed out just 300 feet from the top because it just did not feel right. He noticed a change in the weather, conditions were ripe for potential avalanche. And he realized that if the team pressed on to the top of the mountain, they would not have time to make it down. So he, he and his team turned around and went back to the base. They quit their ascent just 300 feet from the peak, but lived to scale another day. Now, coming back to Quit, your book, you also tell the story of Dr. Stuart Hutchison and his team who turned around just before the peak because they foresaw ominous weather ahead and survived while other climbers who did not want to quit their ascent, they perished. Which one is your favorite personal story of quitting and the lessons it lent to you while you were writing the book? That's question number one. And the second question is, why is it so difficult to quit for most of us? Uh, so, well, let's take ever. So Hutchinson, Taske, and Kasitsky, the three climbers that you're talking about, actually, they didn't turn around because they foresaw bad weather, although bad weather did eventually come. They turned around because they were, they, it, it had to do with the turnaround time. So um, when people summit Everest, there's something called a turnaround time, which is just no matter where you are on the mountain, uh, whether you've summited or not, at that time, you must turn around. So on summit day, that would be 1 p.m. For just the reason that um, Ed Vestiers mentioned, which is you don't want to get, to, you don't want to be there in the evening. You you have to get down from the summit in daylight. It's really really bad not to not to get down in daylight. If you descend in darkness, the, the chances of death are just too great. So, um, so the turnaround time was 1 p.m. and they were going up, and it was like really crowded. This was when mountain climbing was like super popular, right? Like getting up Everest was really popular. There were lots of expeditions. So there's over 30 people trying to get up the mountain at the same time. It's relatively single file. So it was basically like a traffic jam. And their expedition leader came up behind them. Um, and Hutchinson just asked him, like, how long do you think it's going to be till the summit from here? And the expedition leader said three hours and scurried up the mountain uh, trying to make up time. 
So Hutchinson held Tasky and Kasitsky back and said, look, I, I think that we have a problem. It's 1130 right now. And he just said three hours to the summit. So by my calculation, that gets us to the summit at 2.30. Let's say that we were even like fast, like we somehow gained time. We're going to get there at 2. And all of those times are after the turnaround time. So they made the decision to turn around and, and head back. Now, just like the story that you recounted where he's talking about um, turning around, you know, 300 feet from the summit of Everest and so on and so forth. And like it, the the summit is optional and and the, the base is mandatory, which is all true. We don't remember those stories. What we remember is like, he's a guy who summited 14 mountains, right? Like that's kind of the way that we think about it. And we don't remember the quits along the way. And I think that that's true for these three guys. It's like, nobody knows these people. Nobody knows the story of them because it's boring, right? Like where's the heroism here? I mean, at least as we traditionally think about heroism, Right. They're not the they can't possibly be the protagonists of a movie. Right. Except what's interesting here is that they are. They're in the book Into Thin Air, which was Everest, which he, you know, ended up documenting, right? For Sears ended up documenting. But um, so they're in that book. And they're talked about quite a bit as the best decision makers on the mountain that day. Because they just turned around. They said, Oops, it's going to be past 1 p.m. I'm going to turn around. And everybody else continued up. And interestingly enough, the the who's the real protagonist of that book is Rob Hall, who was their expedition leader, who's the one who told them it was going to three, be three more hours until you got to the top. He got up to the top at 2 p.m. and then waited for Doug Hansen to, to get to the top until 4 p.m. Doug Hansen collapsed on the top of the mountain and died right away. And then uh, Rob Hall ended up dying on top of the mountain also. But but Rob Hall's the hero. These three guys, pff, nobody even remembers them. And I think that that's part of the problem is that quitting is just viewed really negatively. And, you know, I mean, think about it. Like quitters never win, winners never quit. You know, if you, you're quitters or losers. Um, it, so it, it, when we see people quitting, we either think, oh, you're so weak willed or we just don't even notice them at all. And we'd prefer somebody who made bad decisions. Rob Hall made a bad decision to continue up that mountain. He was going to get up there at two. I also would argue that he made a bad decision to stay up on the mountain, given that because I asked somebody this, I say, I said, was he waiting for Doug Hansen because he knew Doug Hansen was going to need help down. And that was the only way for him to sort of meet up with him. That was the question that I had. And the answer that I got was no, because it's relatively single file on the way back down that mountain. And so he would have caught him on the way down. He would have run into him on the way down and they both could have descended together. So, um, look, and I don't want to, I don't want to speak ill of anybody here. Like, I'm, you know, he was a very accomplished alpinist, certainly, one of the best in the world. I mean, I think his decision-making was just off that day, you know, and I think to your point, Ed would have turned around in that situation. Um, and, uh, but that's who we remember. You know, I mean, I, I think about this story of this woman, Siobhan O'Keefe, who was running the 2019 London Marathon. And on mile eight, she broke her leg. Her fibula snapped. The medical tent obviously said you shouldn't run anymore. She had 18.2 miles to go. And she kept running, though. She just ignored them. And she finished the race. Now, if we take a step back from that, we can see, like, oh, my gosh, that's such a terrible decision because she loved running marathons. She did it all the time. And, like, she could really – she could end up with a compound fracture. Like, she could never run again. Maybe she's risking being permanently – disabled in some way, right? Like just stop right then, let the break heal, you know, and then go and run your next marathon. I mean, I think we can see that logically, but I think that when we think about it emotionally, we think, wow, I wish I had that kind of grit. What a badass man. She finished a race on a broken leg. That woman's tough. We don't think about it so much as a bad decision. 
you know, and I think that that's really part of the problem. And the thing is that the Shivano O'Keefe's and the Rob Halls of the world are much more common than the, than the, you know, Hutchinson, Taskies and Kasitskis of the world. Like there were four people in just the 2019 marathon alone who finished that race on something broken. Just in that race. Like this is happening to us all the time. Um, and, and I think that it's just really hard for us to stop anything short of a goal because we feel like we failed. And that's Ed's point, right? Like 300 feet from the summit of Everest is a failure. So it's really hard to turn around. But you have to remember the summit of Everest is optional. The goal is to get back down the mountain. And that's the thing that we just forget. Most of the decisions that we make to quit, right? We talked about summiting the Everest. We talked about the broken leg. But most decisions that we make in life to quit, right? Or whether to continue, right? They are not around life and death. They are probably not around uh, hurting your leg. No, are, no. Yeah, qu daily. quitting is just... And this is an interesting thing because I actually, I've, I've been teaching this week and somebody said to me, like, they were trying to make the distinction between quitting in the sense of like shutting your cop company down, right? Um, and on all these other choices as if those weren't quitting. And I think this has to do partly with like our negative view of quitting is that uh, we, we sort of try to make this distinction, but there really isn't a distinction. Quitting is stopping what you started, period. That's it. So if you launched your strategic initiative and then you decide that you need to uh, pivot, which is a word we like to use a lot, go in a new direction, right? Um, that is quitting because you're, you, you started something, a strategic initiative, and now you're switching to a new one, right? When you sunset a product, that is quitting. I understand that you're not shutting your company down. I, I hear you, but you're sunsetting a project that is quitting. In fact, if, like if I fire an employee, it's quitting. We, we don't use the same word for it, but, but it is because I'm quitting the employment relationship. If I sell a stock, it's quitting. Because I started something, I bought the stock and now I'm stopping. Right? So uh, all of these things are quitting. There's, so there's small quits and, and sort of what we think of bigger quits, just in the case, same case of there's small decisions and big decisions on decisions to start. That's true of decisions to stop as well. And they're all quitting. Is there an art and science to that, right? Uh, uh, you talked about decision making, but how does one learn to quit, right? Uh, we talked, uh, you, you talked about the idea of sunk cost, right? We spent so much time and so much money and so much effort on, on an initiative that's so hard to get over that and quit what you started, uh, even uh, when you realize that you may not really reach the end or probably it could be end, uh, end, end up in a disaster or a death as well. But is there an art or science to it? And if yes, what are the yeah. uh, three or five factors that you think that you that come up at the top of your mind in terms of how can one learn to make that quick decision? What factors should one keep yeah. in mind? All right. So we have the intuition that when we get negative signals from the world, we'll stop what we're doing. All right. So like if we're climbing a mountain, we have the intuition that obviously if it started to get dark, we wouldn't continue. If the weather turned bad, we wouldn't keep going. I assume, Vishal, you have the intuition that if you were running a marathon and you broke your leg, you wouldn't keep running. Just assuming. <laughs> right. So uh, it turns out that that intuition is like totally bonkers um, because it's not true. In fact, when we get negative signals from the world, we'll escalate our commitment to the cause. All right. So um, if that's the case, that we're not going to pay attention to the signals when we see them, the question then is, how do you then become better at this? The first thing is that knowing about something like sunk cost knowing that you're not going to see those signals well, knowing that you're going to have a tendency to run toward finish lines because falling short of the finish line is failure, no matter what the progress you've made along the way is, um, knowing all those things is not going to be helpful. Co you know, it's the same thing as like, if I know about confirmation bias, it doesn't mean I'm not going to do it, right? Uh, because these, these cognitive biases are just very strong, um, right? Okay, so, so that's the, that's the, key to the whole thing. So what you have to do then is to say, I need to set up really good processes and systems around me that are going to help me to quit when the time is right. And the best way to do that is to decide 
number one, either decide in advance when you're not actually facing the decision. In other words, if you think about ha T Hutchinson, Tasky, and Kasitsky, why did why were they successful on the mountain that day? Well, because in advance of starting out, they had a deadline of 1 p.m. in advance of that. So it wasn't like when they were in the moment that they were sort of like, oh, should we turn around or not? I don't know. In advance, they said at 1 p.m., if we get butt up against 1 p.m., we've got to turn around. So this is what I would call kill criteria. So you can do advanced planning for a bunch of things. So let's say, for example, that you're in a job that you're unhappy in and uh, you have that initial thought of, hmm, maybe, maybe I don't like this. Maybe I don't want to be here anymore. Um, it's going to be hard for you to be rational about making that decision in the moment. Um, so what you should do at that moment that you have that thought is to say, set a deadline. It's really important to have a date associated with this. How long am I okay with staying in this situation? So let's say that you, you say, I'm going to give it another quarter. All right. So at the end of Q, at the end of Q4, let's say, um, I, what would be the signals that I would see that would tell me that I was still unhappy? So this might have to do with like your sense of fulfillment. Uh, do you dread going to work in the morning, right? It may be that there's a leadership who you think is behaving in a toxic way. Um, and that that is continuing, right? So you figure it out for you. I don't, whatever your signals are, are your signals. And then you can also say, what are the signals that would tell me that things have turned around? So you're basically creating benchmarks. And then you just commit in advance, right? When I see that, then I must, I must quit. Okay. So, and, and along with that, you can say like, if I'm trying to get to the good world or avoid the bad version of this, what are the inputs? So maybe you have to sit down and have a discussion with the toxic boss. Right. Maybe during that time, you can explore other options to have something to compare to, as an example. Right. So you could, so there's things that you would sort of set up in there. But the whole point is that you're doing it in advance. Now, what I feel like is people think that there isn't a difference between these two things. Well, if I'm setting out like I'm going to be unhappy and the boss is still going to be toxic and so on and so forth, aren't those things going to be true at the time? So why do I have to go to do this extra step of writing this down with a deadline in advance? And the answer is because otherwise... When you butt up against it the next time, you're going to do the same thing you're doing now, which is maybe I can turn it around. I don't want to quit because then I'll have wasted all of this time that I've put in and I spend all this time onboarding and learning the culture and, you know, and then it's going to rinse and repeat. And Vishal, I'm, I'm guessing that you know people who have this conversation with you repeatedly, right? Like they're unhappy in their job. You're like, what are you going to do about it? Then you see them three months later and they're unhappy in their job. What are you going to do about it? It's like this goes on for like a year. That's why we want to set these deadlines with these kill criteria that we've set out in advance. And then you want to commit to act when you see those things in the same way that Hutchins, Tasky, and Kaczynski had committed in advance to turning around if it was 1 p.m. All right. So that's kind of thing number one is like this advance work with a pre-commitment contract, setting out benchmarks or kill criteria or exit criteria. The other thing that you can do, which is really helpful, is get somebody to help you with the decision. So remember, I said that like part of great decision making in general is getting outside views, right? Like, what do you think about the decision that I'm thinking about, Vishal? Like, I would really like your opinion on this. Okay, so we want that for quitting choices as well, because quitting choices are decisions, just like everything else. And if I can get your input on something, it's going to help me to see it more clearly. And what I need to do there is give you permission to not tell me what you think I want to hear but tell me what I need to hear. So I have to say, I don't, I don't want you to worry about hurting my feelings in the moment. I want you to really tell me what you think is in my long-term best interest. And if, I can, if we can get that agreement between the two of us, then you can tell me what you see because we're all in that situation. We see someone in a relationship, we know they should quit and uh, the person who's in it doesn't see it or they're, they're pursuing a project that we know that they should stop or, you know, they, they're holding an investment that we, they, we know they should get let go of. And they can't see it for themselves, but we can see it from the outside looking in. And one of the reasons we can see it from the outside looking in is because it's not our sunk cost, right? It's not our goal. It's not our failure. Like none of that is true for us. What's true for them is not true for us. And so we're, we can see it more rationally. Um, and if that's the case, then other people can see us more rationally. So let's get them involved. 
those are wonderful rules i think uh, uh, and i uh, so much relate to them especially the part about setting a deadline and having that kill criteria right as i mentioned uh, uh before we started recording this i i quit my job in 2011 to start this initiative to teach people about value investing and my kill criteria that time for quitting my job was to have uh, uh, some financial stability uh, no mm-hmm. financial liability and two years of savings in my bank account uh, and once as soon as and in hindsight i realized that as soon as i reached that 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 target i put in my papers i also realized that my my second child was on a way but that was not stopping me or that did actually did not stop me from really taking that decision because i had met that kill criteria already of of having that financial yeah so i think i'm going to reframe that a little bit so you said it that so we think about um kill criteria as a deadline Right. And then the kill criteria are what are the things that tell me that I should be leaving? So I would call the financial stability actually the deadline in this case. Right. So so you already know you want to leave. OK, so you've already satisfied the kill criteria. Right. Which is what are the things that are occurring? What are the negative signals that are occurring in the world that tell me that I should change paths? So you then set a deadline for yourself. And that deadline was I need to have this much money in the bank. Right. And, and at, right. Two years worth of savings, financial stability. And when I meet that deadline, then, then I can exit. So it always combines this sort of like state, which are like the signals that are occurring in the world with some sort of date. The date can be an actual date. So it could be, you know, January 1st, right. Or the date could be a deadline like this amount of financial stability that I would count as sort of in that date category. So, so an example of a, of, of that would be um, if I, uh, well, a turnaround time, right? Like the state is uh, no matter where I am on the mountain, the date is 1 PM. Um, a stop loss is sort of an example of a date. If I've lost this amount of money, I must exit. So, uh, so the signals uh, using kill criteria to exit would be to say uh, if the fundamentals change in a particular way, right? That then I would exit, right? So if if it, my thesis is proven wrong, then I must exit, right? So so we want to be sort of thinking about these two things together. And so you had already gathered all the signals that you didn't want to stay in the job anymore, and then you set a deadline for yourself. What has been your most memorable act of quitting? Well, I, you know, I mean, I think that the one that had the most influence on my life was actually quitting graduate school. And um, because I remember I initially took a leave of absence to go play poker. And I think part of the reason why I'm like a little obsessed with the with the topic of quitting is because I was very ashamed of that choice to quit. Um, I felt like I had let a lot of people down. So this is this becomes a really big problem with quitting is that um, uh, you're worried about how other people are going to judge you for the quit. Right. So there's there's two pieces. There's internal validity and external validity, which internal validity is like, am I consistent? Am I a good decision maker? Am I uh, do I have worth um, as I view myself internally? But then there's also um, external validity. So external validity is how are other people viewing me? Right. How are they going to judge me? So if we think in a work setting, external validity will be really problematic because people, if a leader judges, if a leader judges you toward the outcome, just like, did you actually achieve the goal? Then what will happen is people will head toward, toward goals that they should no longer be heading toward because of issues of external validity. How am I going to be judged if I, if I say, I think we should shut this down, right? As an example. So when I left graduate school, I was feeling that issue of external validity really deeply, um, feeling like they're going to feel like I let them down that uh, they had wasted all of this time and effort in training me for something that I ultimately didn't end up doing. And it was really hard for me. I mean, for like two decades, it was really hard for me. I mean, I think it's still hard for me. Um, My advisor, who I reconnected with and ended up having, uh, I was very close with her in graduate school. We kind of lost touch. This was before like internet you know, where you could easily get in touch with people or texting or whatever. But when we reconnected, we, you know, I then started seeing or talking to her at once a week for um, the last decade of her life. And she really tried to relieve me of that problem. You know, she said, no, 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 we were just very happy for you. But it was still very hard for me to get over. And I think that that's part of the problem, right, of quitting is that 
there's all sorts of things that have to do with the way that we're going to judge ourselves or the way that we think that other people are going to judge us that make it really hard to walk away from things. So I, I think that for me, that was probably the most influential. Um, the, the other quit that I've done that I think really speaks to the problem with quitting ha had to do with leaving poker. So one of the things that's really true about quitting is it's very hard to quit who you are. So when your identity is wrapped up in the thing that you're doing, it's really hard to walk away from it because in some sense, you're sort of walking away from who you are in some, you know, if you, if that makes sense. So for me in particular, as a poker player, people knew me as like Annie Duke, the poker player. People didn't even know, by the way, for 10 years, I was doing speaking and cognitive science. I was starting to think about thinking and bets at that point. I was doing consulting and it was actually more of my life than poker was. But nobody knew me as anything other than a poker player, right? I was on television as a poker player, right? So so this is very much my identity. So I, when I decided to quit, um, I think that that was hard for that reason. Like I'm kind of walking away for, from who I am and who I'm known as. And like, what does that mean for me? Who am I going to be when I walk away? And I would say that I got to that decision too late because uh, I probably should have done it earlier, but I kept just thinking, well, I've got this brand, you know, and it's probably useful for me to have this brand as a poker player and blah, 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 which was all just kind of bad rationalization. Um, and I think like most people who quit things, um, you know, it takes us so long to get to the decision. Like we have to have so much certainty around it before we're willing to walk away for some of the reasons that I'm suggesting, right? Like the sunk cost problem, this pass fail thing, like did I pass or did I fail? I'm going to have to walk away from my identity. Um, you know, all of these issues like internal and external validity is that we kind of want people to know that I, you didn't have a choice because if I didn't have a choice, like if I, if I, if I have a startup and it, I end up with $0 and I can't raise another round, nobody questions my grit, right? Like nobody's questioning that. So we'll run it up until that point so that we can sort of avoid some of these issues that make it really hard for us to be willing to quit. Um, because we, we kind of like we want to know because we're so worried. And so in that case, I think we tend to get to quitting way too late, which I think has happened to me in poker is that I, I was gathering too much certainty before I was actually willing, before I was actually willing to walk away from it. That's an invaluable lesson. Thanks, Annie, for sharing that. Um, Moving from decision making and quitting to parenting, you have four kids and I, I'm, I'm sure you are fairly experienced in this job of being a parent as well. So what's your idea of parenting and what are those key lessons that you have passed on to your kids that you wish they practice as they grow up to live good and happy lives? Well, I think I think that I've I think I've done a pretty good job of getting them to understand the interaction between luck and skill. Um, just in terms of the outcomes, right? Like they, they know, like I say things like I've worked very hard for what I have. And I'm also very lucky that I had the opportunity to work hard for it. Right. So, um, you know, so I think that they really understand that, right? Like there are things about like the circumstances in my birth or the opportunities that I had available to me, um, you know, some right time, right place stuff, right? Like with poker, definitely right time, right place. Um, all, all that kind of stuff. And they, they, I think they, they understand that lesson pretty, pretty deeply because I'm, I'm I communicate it a lot. And I, so I, hopefully that's helped them. Um, the other thing is that I allowed my children to quit a lot of stuff because I was thinking about what, what am I actually trying to get them to do? Right. So, so if I'm thinking about enrichment, right. And I'm thinking, well, maybe they should play a musical instrument and they try an instrument and they don't like it. Maybe they just don't like that instrument. I would let them switch to another one, but maybe also they just don't like playing a musical instrument, period. And I would let them to switch to something else like soccer. The point was that it was about like enrichment activities, making sure that I'm serving like the whole child and not having a child who was just like sitting at home playing Super Mario Kart all the time. Um, not that there's anything wrong with that. I just didn't want that to be like a 24 seven activity. Um, and so I would, I would, I was pretty flexible in terms of letting them sample the world with the sort of the goal of like, what's the broader goal? Whereas I think there's a lot of parents who it's like, they just, they think of grit as character building and they're not sort of seeing the big picture of you need to be gritty about the big picture, right? But quit all the stuff that you're trying in order to get to that big picture, like sample a bunch of stuff, quit the stuff that isn't working and then stick to the stuff that is. Um, and I think that what will happen is they'll decide like their kid's going to play piano 
And then no matter how much the kid ha- hates it, they say, well, you have to stick to it because you can't quit because I'm trying to help you build character. So I think I was pretty good on that piece. Um, and then the other thing that I think I was pretty good at was uh, just sort of letting them know, like, I don't really care what you do as long as you feel like it makes you happy. Um, and all four of my kids do very different things to a varying different, you know, varying degrees of like uh, – putting work first or putting personal lives first or whatever. Uh, It's all really, they're all really different. Like one is in public policy. One's a coder. One is a translator. Another one is a nanny and they all love what they're doing. Um, And I think that's great. You know, because I don't want their, I don't want their identity to be around like what is your sort of productivity as defined by society or something like that, right? Like, I just want you to be happy for yourself. Um, and I think I've done a pretty good uh, job at that. Now, if you had like three more hours, I could tell you all the things that I did horribly. But you you asked me for, to that because de- you need to know the denominator. I just want to say that. So going back to the beginning of the conversation, you would need to know the denominator. So trust me, I made a bazillion different mistakes. And there's a whole bunch of stuff I wish I had done differently uh, and all sorts of ways in which I really, really deeply wish that I had been a better parent. But I think when you ask me, like, sort of what are the good things that I did, I would say that those are those are the three good things. If you were to share, so being a parent, I would really love to hear your point over there. If you were to share, what would what is that one thing that you would have done differently with your kids? Do you mean like from other parents or myself? From yourself. Like if you were to go back in time, you would have done something differently in raising oh, your kids. Oh, yeah. One thing? I, I think I would have raised my voice less for sure. I learned a trick along the way, which is this word nevertheless. So, you know, my kids are real debaters. They love to debate. And it would end up getting like contentious, you know, particularly if you have like a teenager debating with you about how long they should be grounded for when they've just like thrown a party in your backyard. Um, It's hard not to sort of get embroiled in that debate and make them want to see your side. Like you have, you want them to agree with you so badly that what they did was bad and they're debating with you and you're getting upset. And then like you end up in a fight. Right. And I did way too much of that. And then I learned this word, nevertheless, which goes like this. I hear you. uh, And I I hear that you think that it wasn't so bad and that all your friends do this kind of thing. And uh, you you think that uh, the, the consequence that I'm giving you is too long and you'd like to negotiate it down. And I've heard all of that. And I hear your points. Nevertheless, this is my decision. And I wish I had figured that one out way sooner because I think it really improved my relationship with my kids when I finally figured that one out. I figured that one out somewhere in the middle of the second one being a teenager, (laughs) that this word nevertheless was like so incredibly powerful and that you didn't need them to agree with you. But like I was so I wanted in some ways I wanted them to see me as reasonable so badly um, which was a completely unreasonable thing to think. And so because I wanted them to see me as reasonable so badly, it ended up with fights, right? Because they weren't seeing me as reasonable because they were children. <laughs> so um, so once I let that go, I think it was a lot better. And I wish I had done that a lot sooner. That's a great lesson. Thanks. So uh, we end nearing the end of the conversation, Annie. And uh, thank you so much for your time, right? I have just uh, four more quick questions. Uh First is four. Okay, first... we'll do a speed round. Yeah, they're like really quick. You can you can take maybe uh, five to ten seconds to res- uh, uh, okay. prepare your response, right? So first two questions combined. Uh, what is the single best piece of advice you ever got, and the single worst piece of advice you ever got? Oh, the single best piece of advice I ever got. Uh, the person who told me to say nevertheless to my children, like literally, I think that was probably the single best piece of advice that I ever got for real. Um, I think the the worst piece of advice I ever got was actually from my mother. Uh, when I was a young child, she told, and I want to just say my mother grew up in the fifties. So let's just take that into account. She said, don't let anybody know how smart you are or no one will want to marry you. I would say that's really bad advice. (laughs) Thanks mom. So. 
There you go. That's the yeah. single worst piece of advice I ever got. Wonderful. Uh, third question. Uh, what are your most favorite books on decision making? And if you have to keep just one book with you and give away all others permanently, which one would you keep and why? Does it have to be a decision making book that I keep? Any book, any book, any book. Oh, okay. Uh, let's see. Well, my favorite books on decision making, I mean, there's there's too many to name, but The Success Equation by Michael Mobison, which I think is so wonderful. Um, Super Forecasting, Phil Tetlock. Um, you know, I mean, obviously decisions are forecasts. You should read that. Um, I think Range is amazing. It's a little bit adjacent to decision making by David Epstein, but it's an incredible book. Um, Perfectly Confident by Don Moore. How to Change by Katie Milkman. Uh, thinking fast and slow, obviously, and noise. Those are amazing. Um, I mean, I don't know. I mean, there's so many, but, but, you know, if you start searching in that zone of those books, uh, you will find other great books on decision-making that will fill, fill in that gap. Um, if I had to get rid of every book and only keep one, I'm trying to think what that book would be, that would be very hard for me. That would make me very sad. Um, I would keep To Kill a Mockingbird. And why? One reason for that. It's my favorite book of all time. It's a favorite book of all time. Point taken. Yeah. Fair enough. Here's my closing question, Annie. Um, everyone walks on their own journey of life and everyone must play their parts well. But what, according to you, is a life well lived? So I'm going to do something a little weird here. So when I was 16, I went to a, a high school that my father taught at. Um which was an Episcopalian school. My father was Jewish, by the way, so it's kind of interesting. He was, he was, I guess, a diversity hire. So, uh, so because it was an Episcopalian school, everybody had to take uh, religion in your junior year of high school. We had to read a, read a philosopher called Paul Tillich, and Paul Tillich was a Protestant philosopher. And my takeaway from this book, it's called um, "The Dynamics of Faith." He talks about this thing called existential disappointment, which really made an impression on me at the time. It's something I've carried with me through my whole life, uh, which is essentially like we can we can sort of reach for finite goals or can, we can re reach for infinite goals, right? So there, there's also a great book, by the way, called in Finite and Infinite Games or Infinite and Finite Games. I think it was Finite and Infinite Games, which is also great because it's in this vein. Uh, oh, and also Algor Algorithms to Live By is a great decision-making book also. Um, so anyway, but so he says you can have finite goals or infinite goals. You can kind of think about it. Like if we go back to Siobhan O'Keefe, you can want to finish this marathon or you can want to be a runner, right? So like if you want to be a runner, that's kind of an infinite goal. You can do that for your whole life. If you want to finish that marathon, it's a finite goal. So finite, the kind of finite goals he was talking about like, are like, I want to have, I want to be a millionaire, right? I want to have a million dollars. And his point was that when you have those types of goals that are finite, um, that you tend to put off the more sort of infinite goals, things like I want to be, ha I want to find a way to find fulfillment and happiness and joy in pursuit of the finite goal. Because what you'll say is when I'm a millionaire, I will be happy, right? When I'm a millionaire, I will find joy and fulfillment. The problem, as he points out, is that at, because you're delaying that work, when you are a millionaire, there's really no difference between you the day before you're a millionaire and the day after. And then you sort of like, you've been working your whole time toward this goal. And then when you reach it, you experience what he would call existential disappointment. So what does this mean for my existence? Because I'm not actually happy. Like I thought this was going to do it for me and I'm not happy. Okay, so now he's doing that as an argument for belief in God. Because he says, you know, God is infinite and we, we could, we're always sort of striving toward that the infinite in that case. Um, I did not actually take that as an argument for believing in God. Um, I don't. What I took that as is an argument for infinite goals. And um, I think that for me, that's the thing that sort of made me the happiest. So I'm someone who just really like, I'm kind of curious about a bunch of stuff. I like thinking about decision-making under uncertainty, how you might do that. Um, I, I love, you know, I, I love like physical activity, 
particularly physical activity that's social. I love being a parent and being a good parent. That that's or trying to be a good parent, striving for that. That's an infinite goal, right? Not like I want my kids to get into Harvard or something like that. No, it's like I want to I want to strive to be a good parent for my children to be as happy and and fulfilled as I can possibly help them to be, whatever influence on that I might have. Even if you look at like my work from graduate school all the way through, it's all like decision-making under uncertainty expressed in all of these different ways. But the particular way that I'm expressing it, I try not to sort of define myself by as much as I possibly can. And I think that honestly, like for me, that's the goal to a happy and fulfilled life is to think about what the long-term things are that you're trying to accomplish and understand that any sort of interim goal along the way is just supposed to be a stepping stone on the way to the bigger thing. It should never be the end point itself. I don't know. That was weird and philosophical, but that's my answer. I think that's a valuable answer. And I think uh, uh, I agree to what you really said of living life with infinite goals and uh, playing that infinite game where you don't really work with a finish line, but you, you, playing till infinity right you're not really right. worried about winning and losing you're just playing the game for the game's sake and not not really for beating someone at it so that's really a valuable right. and, I, and I, I think that when you do that it makes you a better citizen anyway like i mean if citizen is like how do you interact with other humans right i mean i think that that actually uh i think it, i think it makes you i think it makes you a better part of humanity personally like at least i mean that's what i'm going for anyway i don't know if i'm accomplishing it but i'm going for it I'm sure you're doing that so well uh, in terms of teaching what you've learned uh, with people unknown to you and countless of them, me included. So thank you for all your work. Thank you for sharing that 90 minutes with me in in, in sharing your ideas about life, living, decision making, quitting, which is such a topic, which is a topic which is very close to my heart because I have been a quitter all through my life uh, in ways that I think you should be or you would be proud of. So thank you so much for writing the book. And I highly recommend this book and all your other work to other people, to everyone who comes across. So thank you so much for your time, Annie. Thank you.